All wrestling fans, don't you dare be sour. Clap for your world famous six time podcasters and feel the power. Welcome to the Frustrated Wrestling Fan. This is episode number seven. And uh, I'm amazed that I got through that intro because I feel like yeah. uh, crap. So shit. Yeah. One would say. Yeah. So um, I'm probably gonna be hacking up a lung. But in the meantime, let's get into some news. So uh, you pulled up a couple stories. So uh, how about we get into some of them? Yeah, uh, I think the, the first story that. Uh... I want to talk about is the uh, Kurt Angle, All right. uh, U.S. Olympian, WWE. Who wrestled with a broken um, freaking neck. Exactly, yeah. exactly. He was on the uh, Dan Leopardard uh, show or podcast, and he you know, was talking about you know his his days in the WWE and you know various stories and whatnot. And he mentioned that at one point uh, when he was addicted to um, when he had a drug addiction, that he, on top of all of the vitamin vitamin shakes and supplements and whatnot was taking 65 Vicodin. Oh, that sounds totally healthy. Yeah. I mean, just the the thought of that would make my heart literally just stop. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So where is he now with his Vicodin intake? Is he down to 20? Yeah, a, re- a reasonable yeah. amount of 20. He's weaning himself off with what is a reasonable amount of Viking. I would think that by taking one would be kind of bad. Yeah, I feel like like how do you even get on that schedule where it's like is it sixty five? What doctor would even give you that much? Uh, some guy I mean, on the I corner who calls himself just... a doctor, but exactly, exactly. He, he operates out of his own trench coat. But yeah, so that's uh, yeah. I knew he was bad, and that's probably one of the reasons why they will never bring him back to the WWE no, because no. those demons keep following him. And he may collapse and die in the ring. yeah. That doesn't look good, especially when it happens uh, with multiple superstars. Not necessarily in the ring, but you don't want to have a lot of drug-related deaths associated with your company. Even though whenever he does, inevitably. Uh, murder his girlfriend and then overdose he's going to be associated with WWE like the headline on CNN will say former WWE star Kurt Angle <laughs> murders his family even though not an Olympic gold medalist or whatever. Uh, well that'll be like a, a sub heading like former WWE wrestler and Olympic gold medalist the IOC will make sure that's shoved way down there all right so next so Moving on, would you be interested in uh, seeing Matt Hardy uh, with the WWE after his TN- TNA contract expires? I've been watching some of the stuff he's been doing, like the br- with the broken Matt Hardy. I finally watched the final deletion, and that that whole production was just like insane. It was like TNA just gave them all the Free yeah lane. all the budget they <laughs> required in just. Did this sprawling like mini series or whatever, <laughs> and it was it was just ridiculous. Like, okay, uh, they have ideas, but those ideas aren't necessarily good. So maybe if you bring <laughs> Matt Hardy back as talent and not creative, maybe we could see another decent run from him. But uh, yeah, they just yeah. want we just want you for your body, not your mind. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, I never thought of um, when I think of Matt Hardy. I never thought like, oh, he's got a great mind for wrestling. I just thought he was yeah. the the guy standing on the apron while Jeff Hardy he did great stuff. He hasn't been in the ring, the WWE ring, at, at least in six years. I didn't know it was, it was that long. Yeah. So I guess we'll see what happens with that because I'm assuming they'll. They'll use a lot of that crazy Matt Hardy stuff, but I just don't know how it will fit. But I guess we'll see. Are you uh, surprised that uh, Vince McMahon and the WWE allegedly are talking about buying TNA? Yeah, that, I heard there were a couple of bids out for it because it sounded like Billy Corgan just recently bought it, or maybe he didn't complete the sale or something. But now they're already looking for other buyers. So, 
It's <laughs> like uh, a lot of people are saying that TNA is not worth buying. I think they valued themselves on, at forty what, million what? in that. It's tits and yeah. ass. How could you not like? Yeah, but forty million dollars worth. I the most that I would say <laughs> they would be worth buying for is the tape library because they have WWE has a lot of their stars now. So if they wanted to make like documentaries or DVDs about them, they could use all that footage. Um, so that would be cool. I mean, I the one that I feel like it would be worth it for is like Sting. There's like almost ten years of Sting's career that they don't have access to. So that'd be cool if they did a, a DVD on him. But otherwise, I don't really see the point. If they could build it up, and this is always, this was a hope when they did it with WCW, but it's, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. But if they just bought it and just kept it completely separate and did not, like, had a completely different creative team and different marketing and everything and made it into real competition for themselves that would be great but but that name is already tainted and i don't see them wanting to invest that much time in uh, a gamble like that so i would say if they do buy it they're probably just gonna liquidate basically and just yeah pretty much take absorb and pieces of whatever they want organism so we'll see uh, a former WWE writer claims that uh, Stephanie McMahon and Triple H are running both Raw and SmackDown. I mean, that's not uh, a surprise to me. No, since of uh, uh, Vince, uh, you know, he's recovering from his uh, quad tear while doing heavy squats and getting a uh, surgery for that. Um, WWE former WWE writer writer Kurt Bauer discussed on the MLW radio that uh, Triple H and uh, Steph have been in charge of everything and making the uh, final decisions on uh, what goes on the air since uh, Vince is uh, recovering uh, from uh, surgery. Yeah, uh, but I'm sure if uh, Vince uh, shoots them a call, much like Chris Jericho shot to Mick Foley on Raw, that they would just do whatever he said. So he's, he's like... He's still like reviewing like the the scripts and yeah. like overseeing things from his hospital bed. Yeah, he's just a phone call away, and he can mandate whatever he wants whenever he chooses to. So yeah, so we can uh, we can either credit or blame Triple H and Steph for what happened on SmackDown and yeah. this past yeah, week, absolutely for better or for yeah. worse. <laughs> uh, going back to. Um, you remember uh, when uh, Chris Jericho and Brock Lesnar allegedly got into it backstage at SummerSlam when uh, Jericho thought that uh, Lesnar was uh, you know, taking advantage of uh, Orton's uh, head yeah. there, splitting it open? Well, uh, Jericho was on um, a, a podcast uh, recently, and he, uh, he, talk, he gave a little bit of his side of the whole incident, and he, he didn't deny that he and Brock... Uh, had a little brouhaha, a little or uh, nose to nose, nose to yeah. nose, and nose to nose, blah blah mm-hmm. blah. And he, uh, he talked about uh, you know how even though uh, you know Lesnar is like a you know, you know bigger guy, you know he was concerned about his friend Randy, and he, uh, you know he, uh, he he grew up on the tough streets of Winnipeg, <laughs> and you know his dad, uh, you know being in the NHL and all, you know he was gonna you know stand up to him no matter how big bigger he was than yeah him. he was gonna and, pull his shirt over yeah. his head and give him some hockey punches exactly. except brock was hockey probably not wearing a shirt at that time exactly yeah so uh, he uh yeah the, he as what had already been reported you know he didn't know that uh the whole thing was a work and yeah he was concerned there but uh he, he says that whatever you know whatever happened between them is uh pretty much just up to him and brock all so. right they should play that into a uh, storyline and just like bring that on screen, although they have very little time with Brock and they might not want to waste him on Jericho. So Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Bret Hart, um, once again is criticizing uh Seth Rollins. Yeah, he he really needs uh, to get off that kid's back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on, man. He's just he probably idolized him and stuff and uh, I mean he had already when when he said the stuff about um when Brett said that stuff about Seth um, breaking John Cena's nose, you know, a while back, yeah. he yeah, said that I always, you know, said that he was pretty, you know, 
it kind of hurt his feelings a little bit. Yeah, because his whole thing is that he, Brett's always saying that I've never injured anybody in the ring, and I was always safe. Like, blah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. yeah. That, I guess like um, he was at like some, I think it was at some convention that somebody asked him about it, and he talked about how, you know, Seth, you know, he keeps like injuring, you know, these these wrestlers, and like, you know, he's using like the you know, making mistakes in the ring that, you know, like if you do that, you're a lousy wrestler. And, and that, that, that that was pretty much the, um, the money quote, I guess, mm-hmm. was him calling a Seth Rollins a, a lousy wrestler. So. so the move in question in generally is that turnbuckle power bomb, which I guess is at this point has injured sting. Uh, they say basically ending his career and injured Finn Balor. So I could say yeah. at this point you could probably say to pull back or to just stop doing that move, but make a change. Yeah, but I I feel like still need to cut the guy some slack. Wrestling is a tough business, so stuff yeah. happens. Um, but yeah, yeah, I like a uh, Bret Hart. I mean, I, I mean now, I mean I like some of the stuff he's saying. Yeah, but, you know. I liked him as a wrestler. Never care too much for his mic work but he's he's seeming kind of bitter in his old age but but yeah yeah well, he's in the, he's you know back in the news huh, I yeah guess. <laughs> yeah when it goes to go on to yeah wrong. so let's talk about monday night raw Wars, all right Wars. so it starts out with roman reigns everyone's favorite he's yeah i was gonna uh, say fan favorite. comes out to the ring it's interrupted by stephanie mcmahon was then interrupted by McFoley, and uh, everybody's interrupting. Yeah, each other. Um, so this ends up with cage match being set for the night of Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens. Um, backstage, Ke- Kevin is very happy. Yeah, uh, so he's he's backstage. He's mad about the match. Stephanie also seems to be mad about it, but then um, uh, they get over it because Stephanie has this character of like. I dispute what you're doing, Mick Foley, but I'm going to let it happen. So it's like, I don't know where they're going with this, but there seems to be like this, like this undercurrent of tension. Um, this is when Mick Foley gets his call from Chris Jericho. I still don't really know what that call was actually about. Cause I don't think, did they <laughs> actually follow up with it? I know later I he know. like comes and says he's got his grievances and he's going to air out his list later, but I don't think the call really paid off for anything. I didn't even know it was Jericho. Did he? Say yeah, because was... he did a very natural thing of saying, "Chris Jericho, how can I help you?" It's like I don't have a phone like that. Maybe that's just yeah. I say a full name. Yeah. All right. So, uh, I think Lana and Russo were backstage. They were talking about Lana's movie coming out. Yeah. She holds up the damn DVD cover for the camera, her, the interrogation. Yeah, and I think Russo was talking about uh, Reigns because he said, oh, no, he was talking to McFoley. He said, you're just jealous because the Rusev family, uh, you're jealous of the Rusev family because you and your Holy Foley family are pathetic. And you, On the WWE. Yeah, right? you're pathetic and you hate each other. It's like the Holy Foley family. That's, that's what they're called. Um... So, nice yeah, plug. so our first match is uh, Rusev versus Seth Rollins. So I guess this is uh, Seth Rollins' baby face uh, fighting style, even though, like, we'll see it a little bit later, but in his, like, promos and stuff, he's still pretty much playing a heel. Uh, yeah, like, who is the baby face? Who is the heel in this match? Who, who should I guess wrestling-wise, <laughs> Seth was supposed to be uh, the baby face. Uh, they end up having a double count out, but uh, he, yeah, when in they uh, went up the yeah, ramp, they fight it out to the stuff. ramp to the new announced position, and so he jumps off the announce table onto Rousseau, and they acted like he was jumping off like the hell in the cell or something. Like, oh no, don't do exactly. it! Exactly. Like, that, oh, it's all like, high. It look as high as you guys are saying, but maybe it's just the camera angle. Um, so that was it for that match. Uh, backstage, um, Dana Brooke is showing Mick Foley that uh, Sasha and Bailey actually had a double pinfall. Which you mentioned. Yeah, I mentioned that because <laughs> it like, didn't look like a clear win for um, 
Sasha, but so I think people are talking about that online, like me, and mm-hmm. uh, I think keen observers. Yeah, so I don't think that was done on purpose. I think they're just trying to cover up for that. So it ends up being set as a triple threat match between Sasha and Bailey. This makes yeah, D- Dana kind of gave uh, Mick the idea. Yeah, so uh, Charlotte's pissed Charlotte off about pissed. that. <laughs> so she pushes Dana to the ground. It's like she pushed her by her boob in that um I was talking her giant <laughs> Yeah. So I was uh we were talking on Facebook, but I was saying because like we have these brand exclusive pay per views, the Smack SmackDown's first pay per view backlash it ended with nut shots at the end of the the final two go home shows. So I felt like you have like a boob punch at the end of every raw. This was like towards yeah. the beginning, but I feel like this might qualify. So, but then I mentioned that it should be like a, a you know like a, a twad swat. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I think that's a little more extreme. I think you should save that for like g- gentle to no. But the, if you want equality, well, I guess. Like it has to be the same. I don't know if it hurts gentle as much. But I mean, <laughs> we have to have our our, our female correspondent to to exactly. fill us I in would. on that. So, um, but I feel like that's something you say for like Hell in the Cell. But anyway, uh, uh, so that uh, the this, next okay, so go ahead. this this whole like Hispanic Heritage Month thing, like the WWE and like uh, what's it like, uh, NBC, Universal. like the Universal yeah. or Univision or whatever. I thought that was kind of random that they just had this sort of like salute to Cesar Chavez. Yeah, this is weird because I thought like <laughs> usually when they do this stuff, I mean, I guess for the Black History Month they do like sure, wrestlers sure. and um, like George historical Washington figures. Peanut butter. <laughs> so it, it was just weird that they start off with Cesar Chavez. Like they should probably start off with Eddie Guerrero, but they save that I guess because of the cruiserweight thing later. But we'll get to that. So. Um, there's, they were doing previews throughout the night, so they showed a uh, video package for Cedric Alexander and the Brian Kendrick. And they showed their uh, little logo, um, which it, I think it's a weird choice, but I guess they're bringing over the aesthetic from the Cruiserweight Classic and now like the Cruiserweight section of Monday Night Raw is going to be purple-themed. So it's like they're making it, Prince. yeah. So they're making it like their their own brand, except for they're taking place on the show Monday Night Raw. A brand within a yeah, brand. Yeah, so it's like you could have just given them Fabricate, their own yeah. show. Like you could have just spun the Cruiserweight Classic out into just a Cruiserweight only TV show. But this is what they're doing. Um, so then we see. Owens and Jericho backstage. It took, uh, Jericho's talking about his list of grievances. So we have our tease for that. Um, I'm I'm keeping a running tally of <laughs> this move, the wrecking ball drop kick. And I think this week I've actually have marked off three people that did it. Two on Raw and one on SmackDown. If one of them ha- happens in this next match. Um Braun Strowman versus Sin Cara. Um, mm-hmm. So Sin Cara uses his quickness, um, but and it was like the second time that they. Yeah, this is the fought, the rematch right. from the original. So it's, uh, it's really nothing different. I don't have the result on here, but Braun Strowman wins, right? I don't. Yes, yes. <laughs> of course. Of course. Um, but uh, in the middle of that match, Sin Cara hits a wrecking ball dropkick at one point where uh, the move is basically you grab the ropes and you jump and you kick them through the ropes like a dropkick, a front-facing dropkick without leaving yeah, yeah. the ring. Sometimes they leave the ring. But I just find it funny that this move keeps showing up. I don't know if it's something like in my head that I'm just seeing it more, but it's <laughs> definitely... It's definitely being called more. Like they're trying to make yeah. it work. They're trying to make it fashionable. Yeah, because Morrow on SmackDown like calls it every time, like Morrow. wrecking ball dropkick. But yeah, okay. So uh, Sasha and It'll Bailey. Uh, yeah, so Sasha and Bailey backstage, and I just found it funny that Bailey kept saying 
sister. <laughs> like, come on, sister. <laughs> like, Brother. This is weird. It's like, I guess she's got kind of that John Cena slash Hulk Hogan uh, aesthetic, like with the bright colors and stuff. So I guess she's trying to trademark that as her thing. Like, let me tell you something, sister. I'm gonna. <laughs> what you gonna do when Bailey Mania hugs you? <laughs> I could totally see them going in that direction. And if they do, I want credit. Um, uh, so Sasha and Bailey versus Charlotte and Dana is next. So uh, they keep building the story of the Charlotte and Dana split. And it's like, I don't, it's like they keep teasing it, then backing up. But then she goes right yeah. back to Charlotte. It's like she slapped her. I feel like that should have been an irredeemable moment. But it's like, I guess they're just going to do this dance with it to make the fans anticipate it more. I saw something online where like allegedly, allegedly the, the, the WWE, like they're, they want to like, they're going to eventually make Dana like a baby face. And like the whole Sasha, like Bailey thing is just sort of like, it's, it's being used to sort of like get that going at some point. I feel like, I don't I feel know like how, the how Dana thing is. is the smallest issue of all of them. I feel like Dana should really kind of, be pushed to the side for when they are done with this Sasha and Bailey thing, but I guess we'll see. I guess they're building towards that, yeah. but I don't really know if that will work. I feel like I don't mind them splitting, but I don't think Dana should necessarily be a baby face because it's like, don't the baby faces outnumber the heels on Raw if that happens? Because it's like <laughs> you want to have like a decent stable of Got heels. One bad yeah. guy. Yeah. Or bad yeah, so the, everybody's just going to be attacking this one person. Yeah. It seems a little off balance unless they call somebody else up. At the uh, WWE live event in Chicago at, uh, at the Allstate Arena, yeah. Emma was the guest uh, referee. Oh, so she was injured. Um, so is she She's, ready? To she apparently um, was clear has been cleared to fight like six weeks ago, but they haven't had her. They haven't had her back on the. You know, either the shows on SmackDown she had, or she Raw, wasn't but... drafted. I don't think. Yeah, exactly. She wasn't drafted. So it's interesting because the, really the main reason Dana is with Charlotte is because Emma was in the storyline. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They had to drop yeah, it. Yeah, because like she was tagged with Emma. So I'm guessing. So maybe that's a way that Emma can break away and still have that heel angle. Is if she just yeah. goes with uh, if Dana goes with Emma. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully she'll be on Raw and not on SmackDown. It would make more sense because it would be like seven, I think, what, seven women on Raw and seven women on, or six women on Raw and six women on SmackDown. Something like that. Um, like it that. was funny that, um, like, during this match when Charlotte was targeting Sasha's back, I just thought it was funny that Michael Cole was, like, uh, talking to Corey Graves. He said, Corey, you've had many injuries in your career. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, there's a difference between being cleared and actually being ready to compete. And one of his like like his input on that, but I was like, this is kind of insensitive. Like, he's he's really only... <laughs> you fragile, broken piece of yeah, shit. Yeah, like he's only doing commentary now because his career was ended <laughs> in NXT. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of a heavy-handed way to throw that in there. Uh, but true. Yeah. So Charlotte ends up winning this match for her team. Uh, next, we go back to. Seth uh, Rollins, he is in Stephanie McMahon's office, and I, like this is what I was talking about before. It's like he is still he is still a heel, and he is uh, like a wine yeah. heel at that. It's like how are, like how are people supposed to know how to react to him in the ring if he's like like playing these dual roles? I feel like they should just officially turn him already, but he. he still whining again he's saying why did you throw me away and uh, i just came here to ask why um and then he's saying stephanie one of these days you're gonna come crawling back to me um so mm. yeah so that was that segment next we have bo dallas in another jobber match uh another match where the fans were chanting let's go jobber <laughs> yeah, I really wish that would catch on. It's just like, okay, just have these guys beat him. Nobody cares about Bo Dallas. He comes no. out with a sign that says Bo, Bo Leave and Bo, but then he does a poem that says, Only I can Bo Leave and Bo. 
So what's the point of the sign? Like, we're not supposed to believe in you. The only you can do it, so you don't need the sign. Bow to hell. Yeah. Bo leave already. All right. So I just thought this guy, Gary Graham, he looked like a lion, like with his his <laughs> hair and beard and everything. Um, Bo wins quickly, obviously. Um, he came in like a lion, but went out like a kid. Exactly. Um, we see another preview of the cruiserweight division. Uh, they show highlights of TJ Perkins versus Grant. The champ. Yeah, Grand Metalik. Um, next we have Cesaro versus Sheamus. Match six. Uh, next is guess what <laughs> happened? <laughs> yeah, Cesaro wins. Next we have uh, Jericho backstage with his list of Jericho. He's, this is the best yeah. thing of the night. Um, it's funny that he he talked about. Um, Mick Foley using cheap baby face pop, pops as catchphrases, which is exactly what he does. Um, <laughs> so uh, he he brings he brings the list out to the crowd and starts listing off his grievances. And uh, <laughs> he's the best with the mic. He's he's probably the best ad liver. Yeah, he's, that's the thing with Jericho is that he like he always turns heel. But his heel like things that his gimmicks that he says like the light up jacket or the uh, scarf. yeah the scarf or the stupid idiot and like all his different phrases always catch on and end up turning him by accident. <laughs> so he because he even has like subtle catchphrases that he does like when he's out in the ring he'll start like quiet, quiet, quiet. everybody has to say quiet. <laughs> It's kind of like Miz is when my hand goes up, your mouth goes shut. I just like those things to control the crowd because it like gets them even more fired up. So uh, Enzo and Cass come out and interrupt him. Uh, they talk about uh, what real best friends are because talking about J- Bert and Ernie. Yeah, how you doing? Ashton Kutcher and Danny Masters. How you doing? Like who's thought about Danny Masters? And- <laughs> Cause, cause, cause Jericho points that as like being an old reference was like yeah <laughs> just an Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> like, he ain't mispronounced yeah. his name but it's like Danny Masterson is the one you should really think about because what is he on that show he's on some Netflix show now I think it's called The Ranch but whatever he's working yeah so then the shining stars come out and interrupt timeshares blah 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 uh... Uh, then the new day comes out, the crowd explodes, um, and they just come out and say, "We're out here because we didn't have anything else to do." <laughs> so Xavier was is blatantly promoting his YouTube channel, saying they're giving away two iPhone 7s. two iPhone sevens. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's great. Up, up, down. Yeah. Um, then the club enters. Uh, it's like, well, you're always talking about your stupid cereal. And then Jericho leaves the ring and saying, like, you're all going on my list. You're going on. You, you're on it. You. you. Yeah. So. Um, and guess who comes from running, racing down the ramp behind Jericho? Yeah. Sammy it's Zane. Mr. Sammy Zane. Yeah. So I think we come back from uh, the break and they uh, basically turned it into act. mayhem. Yeah. With everyone's beating the shit yeah, out of Yeah, so they turn it into a tag match player. Uh, they pull a they put a Teddy <laughs> long. So it's a 10-man tag. Sami Zayn teamed with the New Day, Enzo, and Cass versus Jericho, the club, and the Shining Stars. Uh, one of these things is not like the other. Shining Stars do not belong. Um, <laughs> so the, the crowd is excited for uh, uh, Big Cass's hot tag. Um, they end up, okay. yeah. They end up doing the bada boom shakalaka as their uh, finisher, the big splash, and they win. Um, next, we see the Eddie Guerrero tribute. And if anybody's watching this on YouTube, and they see me, I'm wearing my Eddie Guerrero "I'm Your Poppy" T-shirt. Yes, Latino. Yes. Week. So after that, they come back to Mick Foley, who gives. 
one of the worst introductions. He kept st- like he messed. What, what, I forgot what he, he said. It's, it? it's not the size of the dog Sorry, in the fight. Cool. It's the dogs in the. It's the. It's wait a minute. I'll get it. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. I did it. I did it right. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> he cleaned it up a little. Yeah. So that was that was horrible. Um, it was rough. So he introduces. Uh, each guy who's gonna be in this uh, fatal four way: Rishwan, Grand Metalik, Cedric oh, Alexander, who had to cut weight to be in the cruiserweight division, and the Brian Kendrick. I think he's just Brian Kendrick now, but but for his last yeah, run, w, former WWE tag champ, he was he was uh, the one who held the record that the New Day broke uh, with um, Paul London. They were the longest reigning WWE tag champs and the new day broke their record. Now they're going for demolitions record, but they, they listed his accomplishments and also mentioned that he was released in 2009. So it's been a seven year journey to get yeah. back on the roster. Although he's been in the company for a, a big portion of those seven years training people in XT. Um, this was very entertaining. Yeah, it was a really good match. A lot of people are feel like um, they don't like the presentation of the cruiserweights, and like, and I go into that a little bit. Like the aesthetic thing, changing everything, the purple and all that stuff, I think is weird. And they had special lighting for them. I think that's a little bit weird, making them seem like segregated from the rest of the show. Um, but it's something I can eventually get over hopefully that'll change uh, yeah, hopefully yeah, it, because it it's kind of what like what they did with Sin Cara back in the day like he he had his special lighting and i thought i always thought that was weird but eventually they, it should be red yeah the, the, the color and the sex should be red like raw because it's born yeah rock. because it's weird i mean i guess this kind of uh adds to differentiating raw from smackdown because smackdown and they established their new championships. They're just like, let's make them all blue. And then blue. it's like Raw has some championships that were left over, and then they established new ones, and none of them are red so far. I mean, the main one is red, but then they bring another one in that's purple. So it's like they're not, they have two different mentalities kind of on the different shows. So I guess that makes them different. I don't know if that's necessarily better. And people probably don't want another red belt, but you just could have had a different kind of looking black belt. But whatever. <laughs> belts, belts, belts. Yeah. So um, another thing people were complaining about was how the commentary was mentioned. You know, and um, a lot of people mentioned this. Said they're talking about them like they're in the Special Olympics. Like, oh, they're overcoming their uh, size. <laughs> it's like, like they're not really overcoming any adversity because they're fighting people in their same weight class so they're all generally the same size they're even yeah people were saying how um on the, the cruiserweight classic it was a ronaldo or it was ronaldo 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 who was doing the um the the uh the, the, the commentating yeah. and you know they seem much better at it than you know, fucking Michael. Yeah, because they're just—they were just talking about them based on their ability and their accomplishments, and like uh, Michael Cole is talking about them, like, oh, aren't they great? Those little small guys—they're—they're they're, totally mentally changed. Yeah, so it's like they're there's nothing about them that should be looked at as differently because they're fighting each other. So it's not like if if you had. Uh, Grand Metalik fighting Braun Strowman, then you have to talk about how he's overcoming yeah. his size uh, and competing in this match. But they're all fighting each other on an even playing field. So just talk about how good they are on their own merits. But uh, a lot of people online focus on that stuff. But really, I kind of tuned out commentary and I just watched the match. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And, just, just look at the, the match. Yeah, and I thought the match was great. Um, a lot of people are saying... It, that, that this doesn't come close to any match from the Cruiserweight Classic, which makes me want to watch that even more now to catch. Yeah, but, it was the first one. Yeah. I, I expected to get to. Yeah, I, I still think that it was great. Um, one thing that stood out to me is that I felt like Cedric Alexander had a really great showing, like between 
his offense and how he was selling um, when he was getting moves done to him. Like when he got when Rich Swan hit him with that right hand and it just like crossed his eyes and it was, like, <laughs> stumbling. I thought like he looked like a star. So I feel like I could see him going far in the WWE. Um, he's also one of uh, the other people this week who performed the wrecking ball dropkick. Um, so, <laughs> see, it's spreading. Yes, it's I, I think oh, there dude. might be like a click backstage. So, uh, so far, this group includes Dean Ambrose, Roman Reigns, uh, Grand Metalik. <laughs> I mean, all the cool kids are doing. Uh, well, no, Sin Cara, uh, Cedric Alexander. And I think uh, Miz does it on SmackDown. We'll get to that. Um, so, like I said, the exchange between Rich Wine and Cedric Alexander, I feel like it was probably one of my highlights of the match. Yeah. And Cedric wins. Yeah. Well, no, Cedric, he's he's on, he looks like he's going to win. He's He hits the lumbar check on Grand Metal League. He's going for the pin, but Brian Kendrick comes in and breaks it up and grabs him in the captain's hook. Kind of like a reverse choke, so he ends up uh, tapping out Cedric Alexander for the uh, to become the number one contender. So at Clash of the Champions. so this this pay per view as of the time we're recording this pay per view is tonight. So this Monday Night Raw was the go home show for Clash of Champions, where there's going to be the first cruiserweight championship title defense. So they determine the number one contender on the show, but they never show uh, the champion TJ at all. I mean, they show like highlight packages. I was and, waiting for him. Yeah, to it was show like up. they said he was backstage in gear, but he, he, like they didn't decide to bring him out. Like at the very least, when Brian Kendrick wins the number one contendership, TJ should just come out on the ramp and like hold up his championship, saying like "I'll see you at the pay per view," but. Nothing. So that was an odd <laughs> choice. Yeah, yeah this TJ, he's, he's a good fighter. Yeah, because, you know, it's a three-hour show. They don't have time for little things like that. It's, yeah, it's details so, and things. So tight sense. on time with three hours. Uh, mm-hmm. Need another uh, jobber. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's so tight on time, but you did have time for a replay of Nia Jax versus Alicia Fox. So. <laughs> They need to to let you know that they are going to have a match at Clash of Champions, even though neither of them are champions. I guess that's why they pushed it to the kickoff. Pre-show. Yeah, kickoff show. Uh, Next is the main event. We have a steel cage match with Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens. Uh, Kevin wants no part of it. Yeah, he just tries to run out instantly. He keeps um, trying to go out the door and climb over the top of the cage. Um... I think, let me see, they're up, when they come back from the first break, they're like standing up on the side of the cage, punching back and forth, and we have uh, a move that I feel like is kind of uh, stolen from SmackDown, because this has become their signature move, is the nut shot. Uh, Yeah, so I think Reigns knocks Owens down, so he's crotched on the top rope. Um, Is the match... Pretty much ends with a uh, couple, Superman yeah, a couple punch. reversals. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Owens tries to do his pop up power bomb. Reigns reverses it into a Superman punch. Uh, then he eventually hits the pop up power bomb, but he kicks out. Uh, there's a top rope Superman punch to the back of the head, <laughs> which is illegal in the UFC. Uh, but uh, Roman Reigns ends up winning by climbing over the top of the cage, which I feel like, like if you're like a tough, badass babyface, you shouldn't be trying to escape the cage uh, in a cage match. You should just try to beat the other guy up. But you know you they end up just doing this. It was a race to the finish. So Reigns hits the floor before Owens could jump out of the door. Then uh, Rusev comes out, beats up Reigns. Uh, Reigns starts to reverse it. But then Kevin Owens kicks him in the face with the door. <laughs> I thought that was a nice move, nice timing on that one. Um, so then they, uh, I like, like Kevin Owens, he just shows how good of a 
a wrestler and a heel character he is because like I'm glad he's the yeah because uh, you know, Rusev's like his thing that plays on his uh, Titan Tron is like Rusev Udria Rusev Machka <laughs> so Kevin is trying to speak to Rusev in his language say Rusev Machka Machka something <laughs> so <he's, laughs> I think that means Rusev Crush so he's trying to tell him that so he brings him in the cage uh, they're beating up Roman Reigns, and then Seth Rollins comes to the rescue, climbs over the top of the cage, and dives on uh, Rusev and Owens for the finish. So it's like this is his big babyface ending to the show going into the pay per view. So they really need to push the gas on this face turn and kind of give up these whining promos so you can start actually getting some good reactions. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and I figure since this is a raw pay per view, we would just go through the uh, card for Clash of Champions now before we smack down. Certainly. Uh, so I'll start from the bottom. Uh, Alicia Fox started from the bottom. Yeah. Number. So we, we have the battle of women with uh, three letter last names that end with X. <laughs> Alicia Fox versus Nia Jax. Serious business. Yeah. Um, there is no reason for Alicia Fox. No, anymore. it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> she's probably going to get speared like off of the commentator's table onto the floor this time. Um, Sami Zayn versus Chris Jericho. Uh, neither of who are champions. But then we get to the uh, <laughs> first championship match of this Clash of Champions card is the Cruiserweight Championship. Cruising US. Yeah, TJ Perkins versus Brian Kendrick. I'm not too familiar with TJ Perkins, but I'm assuming he retains. He's the champ. Since he's just uh, won the championship. <laughs> so. That kind of said he was taken away from as soon as he had it for a yeah. week. Um, next we have Cesaro, number seven of the best of seven series. Can't believe it made it yeah. to the match. Seven. Yeah, so I'm assuming Cesaro's going to win. And this is supposed to be for a championship opportunity, which they were very vague with. So I feel like how they should play this is just do it like money in the bank and you're like, oh, I won my championship opportunity. This is a match. This is a show where all championships are defended. So I'm just going to show up right now. I'm just gonna show up in somebody's Cash match. In. Yeah. Because that would be cool. Like one of these matches that has uh, not as much heat. You just show up like Rusev versus Roman Reigns. You just be like, yeah, it's a triple threat match now. I'm in this match <laughs> and just beat them both. <laughs> I would love for that to happen. Um, next, we have the New Day versus the club, Gallows and Anderson. I hope the New Day uh, wins because I feel like Gallows and Anderson had a hot period. Um, with, like, even though, the yeah, doctors. even though people thought it was stupid, but I feel like if they were going to win, they were like, there was the most interest in that feud at that point. So I feel like it's petering out a little bit. And I don't feel like that's the point where you have the other team win because, like, nobody wants that. I'd rather see them just uh, trudge on and hit that next record. Yeah, there's no excitement. Yeah, I really feel like. The gallows. and Anderson. Yeah, I really feel like the Up better thing to do would be, like, to have the New Day retain and have their next challengers come out and attack them or something. Just lead into the next program because – this one should be over at this point. Um, next is the Raw Women's Championship: Charlotte versus Sasha versus Bailey. And everyone thinks that Sasha's going to win the belt back because, like, like they they had her lose it because she needed time injury, to recover. Injury, yeah, yeah. Injury. I would like to see her with the belt. I also wouldn't mind Bailey winning it, but I think she probably needs. That's so new. Yeah, I probably think she needs yeah. a little more. Way yeah, way. building up and for people to get more familiar with her so they'll be more excited about it. Like uh, Becky Lynch. Yeah, because uh, that's one thing I was uh, listening to RBR, Weekly Wrestling Talk, and they were talking about how like out of the women who were brought in for the Divas uh, revolution, Becky is the one who feels like the most homegrown on the main roster because she didn't yeah. have like huge buzz coming from NXT but she built it all up in the main uh, roster on Raw and SmackDown so people got to know her after that. So like 
Sasha had her trials and tribulations. Yeah, so Sasha had buzz from NXT already. So she just came in and she was over. And Charlotte had her reputation and she had her name and she just rode on that and built off of that. But Becky built herself up. So I feel like um, Bailey probably needs to get to that point. And I mean, she already has buzz from NXT, but she needs to get that more uh, recognition stuff on the main roster. So I'm assuming maybe Charlotte retains or Sasha wins. I hope Sasha wins, but we'll see. Uh, next we have Rusev versus Roman Reigns. Don't care. Hope I think <laughs> Rusev just retains. Um, next we have Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. I don't see any reason why Rollins would win this one. I feel like the end game for his uh, run right now is Triple H. So I think he's just going to move on to that after this, so hopefully, I can see it. I can see it going either way. Actually, I feel like because of how this angle is going and that it's going to end with Triple H, I feel like if Rollins is in any position to beat him, then there's going to be shenanigans and maybe Triple H shows back up to make sure it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So, I feel like that's the end game for that. So, they're probably not going to put him up against Triple H because he feels betrayed. Because Triple H kept from He used to be yeah, yeah he used to be the their He used little, to be uh, their guy and then Triple H took away a title opportunity from him. So I don't think Pedigree Yeah, so I don't think he's gonna still have a reason to have that match with Triple H if he wins the championship that he was so mad about not winning. So I was assume he still goes uh without gold and continues his Hatred towards the former authority, but we'll see. So that's the card for Clash of Champions, which is tonight as of the time of this recording. And uh, let's get into SmackDown. SmackDown. SmackDown starts out with a women's contract signing. I think they said this was the first ever. I don't, although I think it's the first ever on SmackDown. I'm pretty sure they had one with Charlotte yeah. and Sasha on Raw. Maybe in the past, I think I think I I know it was Charlotte and somebody like because I mean Charlotte had the title for the longest, so it was somebody competing against Charlotte. Um, then they talk Becky. Uh, so so Becky and Alexa Bliss. Like, uh, did you sense there were any there was any real animosity between these two, or was it did it seem kind of forced? I feel like I feel like <laughs> it was all uh, done in uh, a work context, but I felt like. This was Alexa Bliss's first outing and first time on the mic. So I had kind of that cringe factor of like, uh, I hope yeah, she does like, good. Uh... I, I think she was decent. There's there's stuff to build on from there, but it took it's gonna it's just gonna take a little more repetition and, and getting up there. But I feel like she was decent in this first time on the mic. Uh she's saying you weren't born to be a champion. And then Becky does uh, kind of what I it sounded to me like a Dolph Ziggler promo, like, yeah, maybe I wasn't born. And I think Ziggler actually did a version of this on this episode, like, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> supposed to be the champion. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be the you're champion, right. but that's what I. I watch too. too much TV, and I I dream too big, and I I fought my way to get there. Uh, so I think this was good coming from Becky. Um. Alexa hits Becky with the contract and then tries to run off. Becky uh, comes from yeah. behind on the ramp. Yeah, and then she gets away. Uh, next, we go backstage with The Miz and Daniel Bryan. And uh, basically, uh, Miz is trying to get out of a title match. And Bryan says, oh, I guess you didn't read that contract. It says you have to defend the title. But although I don't think this is going to be enforced, yeah, I think he's really just put in the screws to him because like how does the contract actually say it does he say he has to defend every <laughs> week because you have to follow up on that next week i think he it may have just been like at the general manager's discretion when he says you have to defend the title then you have to defend it maybe that's that open ended or something like that we'll see uh next we have the usos versus american alpha 
<laughs> and I felt like uh, the Usos came out looking like uh, the Chicago Bulls from the nineties. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> like spray, like the red with red yeah dirty, red and black uh, like like just dumped red paint yeah on it. <laughs> uh, they showed a insert promo of American Alpha being angry and there's some guys that also need some work on the mic <laughs> a little bit more than Alexa Bliss does um, <laughs> it's funny that during this match it was kind of sad that um, David Otunga was on commentary and he kept trying to get out this story um, about, like, he said he was filming a movie and Rikishi was on set. And, you know, that's the father of the Usos. And he kept mm-hmm. trying to say, like, oh, I was talking to Rikishi. I was trying to find out what's, what's happening with your boys. Why are they taking this new angle? And, like, he kept getting interrupted, like, throughout the entire match. He never actually finished the story. <laughs> like, he, he tries to bring it up the first time. Then they do a, they cut him off to do a replay of the previous match. And just, like, throughout the whole thing, like, he never was able to get it out. He tries it a third time at the end of the match, but still they do a replay of the finish. <laughs> so he, he never ends up getting to it. Mr. Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. Uh, so I just like the, the, the psychology of this match was good because like they kept working on Gable's leg. Um, and then they had the point where, uh, his injured yeah, leg. they had the point where, um, Jordan was in there and he like, he was getting beat down and he wanted to go to Gable for the tag, but he could see how hurt he was and he didn't want to tag out. And then he ends up being the reason why he loses. So like, like. I don't feel like any tag match I've seen in recent memory has had like that much detail. <laughs> like, oh, okay, he can't tag this guy, so he has to go on his own. It's like usually they do the angle of like this tag team was put together and they don't like each other, so that's why they don't want to tag. So I felt like this was some good um, psychology put into this match, which that type of attention detail usually doesn't happen in the tag division. So I thought that was cool. I just really don't like uh, Jason Jordan's like taunt he does uh, after he, he like charges into the corner and he does this thing like it looks like <laughs> it looks like Goldberg on the toilet, but retarded. Yeah, Goldberg. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so then they, I think the Usos, they win it, don't they? Do do the uh, double super yeah, kick yeah, yeah. and then splash for the win on Jason Jordan because he couldn't tag out. Um, next, we go backstage with uh, Rhino and Heath Slater, and Rhino loves uh, cheese whiz and crackers. Yeah, he's like, I guess they just fling <laughs> it with them now. Um, so he's saying that they should do it. Uh, Slater saying that. Rhino should do a gimmick like the Usos and say, when I say right, you say no. And people are actually in the audience uh, doing the no. No. (laughs) So that might catch on. We'll see. The Usos come back and like they they sloughed off to him. You're like, I just smacked those crackers out your hand. They're touching my crackers. (laughs) So it was funny. Uh, He said uh, what do you say? I'm a, you say you go back home to your 26 raggedy ass kids, it's like because the, the number just swells every day. Um, next we hear about um, the match between Randy Orton and uh, Eric Rowan from the Wyatt family. So <laughs> look forward to that. That. <laughs> we know very, very little about uh, Mr. Rowan. He doesn't talk much. Well, or... when, they, when they originally broke up from the Wyatt family, we found out that he was a wine connoisseur, uh, a oh. vintner, and he can um, he is very quick with finishing a Rubik's Cube. That was the way they decided. That is fascinating. That's the way they decided to go with him as a single star, and that is why he is no longer a single star. Or a star <laughs> in general. Um, so I liked Morrow's mention of uh, Drake in this <laughs> preview. said, Randy Orton's rivalry with Bray Wyatt went from zero to 100 real quick. <laughs> it's like, Morrow, <laughs> he just has this checklist no. of like, I have to mention Drake this episode. <laughs> um, 
He's, uh, I think Mar- he's a fan. Yeah, he's Canadian also. So he has to shout out to his Canadian brother. Uh, we have a, hist- a Hispanic heritage moment with Roberto Clemente. <laughs> so Pittsburgh Pirates uh, Hall of yeah. Famer. Um, Jack Swagger comes out for commentary for this match with Apollo Crews versus Baron Corbin. A match, uh, no. another match nobody no. was waiting for or caring about. And I like Jack Swagger, but he probably doesn't need to talk as much as he's <laughs> now because I uh, I hear a lot of people dogging him like the thing with Swagger that doesn't work for him is that they try to put this they try to that whole USA gimmick they do stuff. the USA gimmick and they force like uh like this angle of like what they think is like a charismatic performer like kind of like a Heath Slater something that seems to come like slightly more naturally to him when he cuts his promos, but they trying to put that on swagger in like, I've seen him on uh, Xavier Woods show up, up, down, down. And he's more mellow than that. He's kind of a chill guy and like making him do all this stuff. This loud voice. Yeah. It it doesn't really match him. And plus he has the lisp and that doesn't really help matters so speech yes. impediment kind of so, prevents you from being a bit of a bragger yeah so it it doesn't really work in the execution so i feel like they they, they should tone that down a little bit because i think he says something uh he comes into the ring at some point he says ladies and gentlemen the rolling stones <laughs> it's like nobody reacted it was like uh we don't get that, re- that reference. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you got millennials and younger. And... <laughs> Who are the Rolling Stones? Yeah, it's like, what's that? i seen that in, in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, Baron Corbin beats Apollo Crews, of course, because Apollo Crews is, is nothing. Apollo Creed Crews. Yeah, he's nothing right now. Um so Corbin walks up to Swagger, as that usually happens whenever a wrestler is doing commentary on him. Yeah, and I think, I don't know if the writers are this smart, or Baron Corbin is this smart, but I feel like there's some parallels with what happened here, because uh, Corbin comes out to Swagger and says, you should have stayed on Raw. And I think this is funny, because there was a time where, I think when Apollo Crews like, first debuted in NXT, um, uh, he faced Baron Corbin and he was beating him up in like his in his trash talk. He was saying, "It's like you should go back to ROH." And he, he was trying to be like edgy and talk about another company, <laughs> but like people like online and in the crowd, I think highlighted like uh, his name was uh, Uha Nation on the Indies before he was Apollo Crews. But they're like he never competed in ROH. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, uh, the, so it's funny. It just made me yeah, think of that. that but is. yeah. So next, it's funny they did a like a cr- congratulations to Rami Malik for uh, winning the Emmy yeah, Award for Mr. Best Robot. Actor in a Drama for Mr. It was like, Robot. Why? It was like it was, <laughs> corporate I synergy. Guess, that, the that's that's the only movie. reason for that. It was like you got to mention our Emmy wins. It's like. Just show like little promos between the commercials. You don't have to force us to say this stuff. There are lots of uh, Mr. Robot fans who watch WWE wrestling on USA. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. I guess um, I'm trying to think what is there a stable in WWE would be uh, analogous to F Society because that's the, the <laughs> angle on the show. But I I can't think of anybody. It would be like somebody like the Nexus or the Shield from back in the day. But anyway, next we have I digress. we have Kurt Hawkins facts again. And this time with voices. Why? Kurt actually speaks. <laughs> why? 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 That's the only thing I have to say about this. Like two weeks ago they said Kurt Hawkins is gonna debut next week on SmackDown. And this is his debut last week he just said these chuck norris well, facts in this time. it depends it on what your definition it. of debut is <laughs> his debut is just a talking uh 
uh, he can say the facts now with his own voice. Yeah, a live talking personality. Well, not even live. He doesn't come out to the ring. He just cuts these video promos, and it's like, like they could have started with these because he's not there in the studio. I mean, he's not there in the ring. So like they could have just done all of these and shot a year worth and like, Hey, here's Kurt Hawkins. Let's just see what, yes. Like, what is the point? Is Kurt, Ho- is, is Kurt Hawkins injured or something? Is that why he's not wrestling or he's just, I think not... he just sucks. And that's why he's not. <laughs> so, well, that's a good reason. Yeah. So whatever. It's a time to face the facts. What does that mean? Because like, <laughs> like face reality. Yeah, it's like reality if you want to face, face the you. facts, are you talking about these facts that you just spat out? And just the facts. Man. If that's the case, then we're facing them. We're watching this stupid thing right now. So whatever. Um, backstage with Naomi and Nikki Bella. Uh, now I think the. This was kind of weird because I think the interviewer asked her a different question than Naomi actually ended up answering, but she just goes into explaining what the glow is, uh, saying uh, that she's got the glow and she knows Nikki has the glow. And it's funny that Nikki is like, oh, thanks, Trin. That's so sweet. It was like, she said Trin instead of Naomi. It's like, that's like, that's They're a real thing. Really. <laughs> like, like, kayfabe, kayfabe, remember. <laughs> um, but I don't think anybody really noticed. But um, uh, Naomi says Nat- uh, Natalia's glow has fizzled out a long time ago, and Nikki goes into saying that Carmella is nothing but a bootleg. So uh, she's in their tag match later. Shots fired. Um, we go backstage with Dolph Ziggler, also who cuts his version of uh, the Becky Lynch promo that I wasn't <laughs> supposed to be the the most winningest uh, wrestler in Kent State history. I wasn't supposed to be a Kent State Hall of Famer, but I did it. So he compares yeah. he compares Miz and Maurice to Brangelina. Topical. Yeah, because if Morrow wasn't going to do that topical yeah. reference, then the Miz was going to get to it first. Um, he says, uh, tonight I can do anything, so hit my music. And it's funny <laughs> since the brand split, they've been doing a lot more of uh, th- that thing backstage where they say, uh, play so and so's music, and then they start playing it, then they enter the ring. I think it's funny that they, that's a new thing that they're doing now because usually the music <laughs> just starts magically. And we don't know how it happened, so now they're like paying extra attention to that, like the wrestling elves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So now we see how the how the sausage is made. Uh, so this is the IC title match with Ziggler versus The Miz. They do the uh, they mentioned that it's day one sixty nine of sixty nine yeah, of The Miz's <laughs> uh, never ending. Intercontinental Championship World Tour. Although, I mean, I guess they've done some overseas stuff since he's been champion, but it's like it's been most of his time in America. It's not much of a world tour. Uh, <laughs> so they do the in ring announcements like they do for big championship matches. Uh, Miz is, I guess, he was just recently put into the Kent State Hall of Fame. I guess it was uh, this past week. So. I guess Mm -hmm. to call attention to that, he does a lot of ground wrestling um, to show his amateur background, to show he's legit. He's a real wrestler. He's a fake wrestler. Yeah. Uh, So I think Ziggler ends up on the apron and Miz hits him with another wrecking ball dropkick. This was the first of the week that was actually called by its name, even though I... Yeah, even though I wasn't, I was gonna let this one pass because Miz didn't grab the ropes. He just like jumped and kicked forward. But Marvel was like wrecking ball drop kick. So like, oh, there it goes. There's another one. I put that on my list. Uh, yeah, and uh, at one point Miz does the uh, he does the Daniel Bryan uh, yes. Yeah, he does a uh, little thing with the fingers. He does the points and then he does Taunting. the kicks too. And the crowd actually chants along like yes, yes, 
<laughs> so I thought that was uh, funny. They're teasing the match between Miz and Daniel Bryan. That will they're gonna, never happen. They're going to wrestle. That I will think happen. it won't happen. He had a it will seizure it on SmackDown. That's the what, what that's but he's 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 healthy, he's better now. They're, it's the only logical sued. conclusion. He's gonna be paralyzed <laughs> and they're gonna get sued. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, here's another line for Morrow, and I guess I'll give this one uh, to Morrow as his line of the week. Although Morrow has some really bad lines uh, uh, during some weeks, but this one I thought was subtle <laughs> enough that it's one of those lines you can go back to. Like, I know JR uh, used to have lines in the past that he would uh continuously bring out like he's getting beaten like a government mule or he's running away like a scalded dog so this is one you can mention for miz he said it's, he dropped that axe handle like he drops hollywood names i just thought that was funny like plays <laughs> into his into his persona movie star gimmick yeah man. uh let me see so they uh, Ziggler does his splash. It's funny they're calling every splash to the corner now a stinger splash. Like, uh, I guess, like they were just regular splashes. Now the sting is has joined the WWE family. Finally, now they're just they're giving that name over to him. Like they always mention Ric Flair when someone does the figure four. Now the splash belongs to Sting, I guess, because whenever Ziggler does a splash to the corner, they say Stinger splash. Yeah. So it's interesting, and I guess that that does more to tie uh, Ziggler with Sting because when Sting was doing his promos for his match versus Seth Rollins, what was it a year ago or so? They mm-hmm. they did a promo for him, but they didn't use Sting's actual voice. They actually used a warped version of Ziggler's voice. They have <laughs> some kind of weird connection uh, that I think is interesting. Um, so Ziggler goes to throw Miz into the steps uh, because I Miz. Uh, grabs his belt and tries to leave so Ziggler throws him into steps he's still holding the belt I was worried that he was gonna like damage the belt when he threw him into the steps like that yeah, don't yeah so it. then he throws him back into the ring and he Miz is still holding the belt the ref goes to pick it up and put it out of the ring and Miz grabs the spray that Maurice was holding sprays him hits <laughs> the, his finisher for the win so I just thought that was dastardly and sneaky uh, next, see he doesn't need his wife. To yeah, play. next we see a preview of Cena versus Ambrose, and they say for the first time, which I'm not sure. I'm sure I they've... believe that. Uh, it's probably first time on SmackDown, but I don't. I'm thinking Cena had a lot of uh, back and forth with the Shield, so I'm sure they fought at some point. Then they're so fast and loose that WWE. Yeah, uh, they mentioned. Orton versus Rowan coming up again, and Morrow mentions his zero to a hundred reference again. <laughs> uh, uh, this match is quick. Orton versus Rowan. Uh, Orton hits his uh, spike DDT on Rowan, and uh, JBL throws a shot at Raw, saying, "There's an announcer who used to say vintage Orton. I can't remember who that guy is. <laughs> it's like there's some shade at Michael Cole who used to have a podcast with." Um, so he's the RKO for the win, and then Derp uh, disappears. Lights yeah. go out. Uh, lights go out. Sheep mask is left in the ring. It looks like it has like clown makeup on it, uh, but whatever. So Rowan just disappears again. Uh, so then Wyatt cuts a rambly promo again. <laughs> says, we are bonded by the most unholy of matrimony. To death do us part, Randy. So that's really creepy. Um, <laughs> They're married yeah. now. So you're still just a man, a man who could die at any given moment. I was thinking, like, it's just getting real. He's threatening his life. Kill him? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a god. The god can never die. This is the PG yeah. era. Run. So then he derps out. And that's the end of that. Derp, derp. Yeah. Uh, next we have Nikki Bella and Naomi versus Carmella and Natalia. Uh, yeah, did you see the um, when they do the, the little little Caesar's seat upgrades for yeah. uh, some random family during yeah. the show? The Hoffman Yeah, congratulations. Family. Yeah, wow. That's, yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say. I've, I've never won anything in my life. Yeah, so I, I 
I'm I'm very jealous. Uh, I just had some Little Caesars <laughs> yesterday. In... Did you have Crazy Bread? Crazy Bread. I had some. Actually, I had it twice this week. So I had I had oh. the Crazy Bread on Monday, and then I just had two hot and ready pizzas <laughs> yesterday. Uh, uh, uh. That, that makes me want to get some. Like, football's yeah, because they just uh, built one like around the corner for me, so it's like it's packed now. But they actually have a drive-through, <laughs> so that's awesome. Oh, even yeah. Better. So I just I just sit there and wait for my hot and ready pizzas, which they bring out immediately. Sponsor our podcast, yes. Little, Caesar's, Caesar's. Little Caesars. Little Caesars is the best. Little Caesars, Please. give us money. Okay, let's stop. Please. We haven't gotten paid yet. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so this is a quick match. Carmella gets disqualified for going too hard. Natalia, like, she has uh, Nikki Bella in her sharpshooter, and Bella just drags yeah. her out of the ring. It was like, what kind of tag team partner are you? Um, Did you see, she was on um, Talking Smack, Carmella, after the show, and she was like, you know, Renee Young and um, Daniel Bryan was asking, you know, like, why do you hate, you know, Nikki so much? And she basically was get this whole, like, rambling thing, because because I'm Carmella, <laughs> and, like, you know, I'm... Nah, 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 nah. Like, oh, I'm shit, glad I missed up. that. Um, she's doing a good job of making people hate her. Uh, at first, it wasn't on purpose, but now, exactly. I'm now at least, I'm doing it on purpose. at least their intentions and the reactions are going in the same direction. Um, so yeah, uh, Naomi ends up booting Natalia at the end of this segment, and Carmella just walks away, saying how fabulous she is. Um, next, we're backstage with AJ Styles. It's funny how the, this new interviewer, I can't remember her name, but she's like very aggressive when she comes to it. She's like, <laughs> hey, AJ. He's like, oh, he scared me. <laughs> um, so he talks about what a rivalry is. It says competition for the same goal. It's like, I don't have a rivalry then because they're not my competition. He says, I'm the superior AJ Styles. So maybe that's his new nickname. The phenomenal superior. Yeah. So maybe he's just going to add that to his t shirt. Like, PS1 instead of just P1. This is going to sound like PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I like him as the... As the, um, the yeah, champion. just like the cocky champion who feels like he's in charge of the whole company. I think that's a good role There's more, the, more stories to get out of it. Yeah. yeah. So Cena versus Ambrose was the main event. Uh, it's funny how... Kind of yeah, it was it was pretty quick, and the ending wasn't what I expected, because they had a little back and forth. I think they both kicked out of each other's finishers, but then it ends up in a roll up, which was a surprise. <laughs> like, okay, I guess uh, there's. Cena was certainly yeah, gone. so I guess there's more to come from that. It's funny how they got the exact shot of Cena that they got at the end of uh, WrestleMania a couple years ago, where he was sitting on the ramp after The Rock beat him. Like he was sitting in that exact position, and you can see, like, with this new stage just like completely lit up, it looks kind of like the exact same scene. So, that was funny how they ended with that. Uh, AJ comes like out of nowhere, just out of the crowd, and elbows him. So, I thought that was funny. And then he, uh, he comes in and gives the Pele kick to Dean Ambrose, and is just basically saying, I'm the champ, nobody's better than me. And show ends early. Yeah, yeah, Ambrose then turns around, gives them dirty deeds, and then that's the end of the show. So that's SmackDown for the week. I feel like between which show was yeah better? between the two shows, uh, I feel like since there was more interest in like newer things happening on Raw, the cruiserweights yeah, yeah. that gives it the edge to me because SmackDown just seemed like it was kind of business as usual uh although like raw had a, a, a decent amount of down spots but the cruiserweight stuff and like even the main event yeah and uh but the cruiserweight stuff and the, the big tag match with jericho and new and those guys yeah Chris, the, the list of greens yeah i felt like that jericho was uh one of the highlights and i just like in that segment with jericho is like they had all their best talkers out there Except for the Shining Stars, but they had Jericho, <laughs> Enzo, and Cass, and the New Day. It was like that's like an All Star segment right there. Yeah, I was like, can I say like like they, they keep saying how like Raw and SmackDown are like 
you know, their rivals and each brands are fighting each other, but they, they don't air on like the same night. Yeah, it's like you and like they can raw. never really compete with each other. Like you could talk about who got better ratings for the week, but there's a lot of factors to but, go but into that. Like, the bra is like getting its ass its ass kicked by Monday Night Football. Yeah, so it's like there's like there's different factors because it's like okay, maybe if SmackDown was on, of course Thursday, SmackDown's gonna get better ratings. Like, okay, you got Monday Night Football and Thursday Night Football, then you could say <laughs> okay, who who did best against football? But it's like they're not competing against each other, so who really cares? It, I you really could just have one as a continuation of the other. But either way. Uh, that's our show hey, for this week. Uh, we own yeah. them. Yeah, uh, we should. If we did, I think I'd make um, some better decisions. I would, I would get rid exactly. of all that. Purple. We wouldn't have had Cena lose so easily. Yeah. At the end of SmackDown. Yeah, I have him lose, but not as easily. I, Clean yeah, I, I get rid of the purple uh, from the Cruiserweight Classic, and uh, wouldn't have Michael Cole do commentary. <laughs> Or do the play by I, play. I feel like Cole doesn't really have a purpose anymore because a lot of people no. are down on Byron Saxton, but I think he does just a fine job. Doing... I like Byron. I, I would I would love to have like a Mauro Ronaro and like Byron Saxton. That wouldn't be bad. I don't mind just Corey right. Graves and Byron because I feel like they play off each other well, like much better than JBL did because he just seemed like so <laughs> mean. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I think Raw has the edge, and I'm excited for the pay-per-view specifically for the cruiserweight match. And I'm hoping they figure out a way to get more of the cruiserweight division. Cause it seemed like they just have their segment, at least from this week. I would like to see like maybe two or three cruiserweight matches during raw going forward because yeah. like they have a lot of space to fill. So they should just take three advantage friggin of that. Hours. Because like you have a whole division of cruiserweights. You can't just give them just one match during the, the show, so we'll see how that goes. They only do mm. one what female. Well, they're starting to do. I mean, on the Raw, team. they're doing a little bit more because they have the Nia Jax thing, and then they also usually do something. Like oh Charlotte yeah, yeah. Sasha. Uh, I, f- I forget about that because it's so yeah, because it's like it's, it's like a in a freak show in the middle of the segment, so you forget yeah. that it's it counts. Um. So yeah, anything else you want to mention from the week before we wrap up? Uh, no, pretty much that. Uh, you know, I heard that a uh, WWE Live, the house show at the All Star yeah. Arena, went uh, very well. I know that. Uh, think, think, um, think Charlotte. I'm trying to think like who the results. I know that Lesnar beat uh, Orton in the rematch, quote unquote. So that's the that's the big <laughs> headlining match for that and. I'm jealous that like people who just paid for a house show got to see like the legit version of that match. I'm hoping there was exactly. a little bit more to it than there was in the SummerSlam match. Uh, I would yeah, assume so. I heard, but I heard they would like sold out and that the crowd was a you know crowd was real electric. Of course, and, it's Chicago. Chicago's yeah, a great crowd. Exactly. Um, so yeah. they're coming back. Um, they announced after the show that they're coming for the final Raw and SmackDown of the year. Uh, December the 26th and the 27th at the All Star. All right, awesome. So I'll check that out. All right, so that's all. All I right, got. so let's give our plugs. Go ahead and give your details for the peoples out there. I love Little Caesars Pizza, and my uh, my Instagram is at Tony Hoffman Shy. That's C H I. Uh, my uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter. You can find me, Anthony Hoffman. All right. Don't forget your Tinder details. All those ladies want to like swipe Tinder on details. you. Just like swipe let them know what they're looking for when they swipe on Tinder. <laughs> well, my name is Anthony. My age is 32. And my profile picture right now is the uh, uh, Jay Cutler on the sideline uh, with a Photoshop cigarette in his mouth and a bottle of beer. Because Jay C- Cutler uh, sucks and he has a bad attitude. All right. <laughs> All right. And my details are I'm on Twitter at Zach from Chicago. That's Z A C from Chicago. Okay. Yeah, if you, no, I hate K's. There's no K in my name. <laughs> Don't ever mention a K around me again. All right. He hates Koreans. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to follow me on Instagram, I don't post that much, but I'm ZH Radio on Instagram. You can also find me on YouTube by going to youtube.com slash ZH Radio. 
You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Frustrated Grad. Oh my yep. god. And on YouTube at youtube.com slash frustrated grads. Get the views. Yeah. Um so this video version of the podcast is gonna be on YouTube. But if you want to check out the audio, you can go to frustratedgrad.com. See you anyway. Yeah. And you know, the audio is up there as well as iTunes and Google Play Podcasts. So that's it for this episode of The Frustrated Wrestling Fan. Thanks for joining us. And that's all you get for today. Finn Balor. So I could say yeah. at this point, you could probably say to pull back or to just stop doing that move. But Make a change. Yeah, but I, I feel like still need to cut the guy some slack wrestling is a tough business so stuff yeah. happens um but yeah yeah i like a uh, bret hart i mean I, I mean now i mean i like some of the stuff he's saying yeah I, mean, I, I liked him as a wrestler never cared too much for his mic work but he's he's seeming kind of bitter in his old age but but yeah yeah but he's in the, he's you know back in the news so i guess yeah when it goes to go on to Raw. Yeah, so let's talk about Monday Night Raw. Raw All right. Is war. So it starts out with Roman Reigns, everyone's favorite. He's, yeah, I was uh, going to say fan favorite. Comes out to the ring, it's interrupted by Stephanie McMahon, was then interrupted by McFoley, and... Uh, Everybody's interrupting yeah. each other. Um, so this ends up with cage match being set for the night of Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens. Um... Backstage, Kevin is very happy. Yeah, uh, so he's he's backstage. He's mad about the match. Stephanie also seems to be mad about it, but then um, uh, they get over it because Stephanie has this character of like, I dispute what you're doing, Mick Foley, but I'm gonna let it happen. So it's like I don't know where they're going with this, but there seems to be like this like this undercurrent of tension. Um, this is when Mick Foley gets his call from Chris Jericho. I still don't really know what that call was actually about. Because I don't think... Did they <laughs> actually follow up with it? I know later I he know. like comes and says he's got his grievances and he's going to air out his list later. But I don't think the call really paid off for anything. I didn't even know it was Jericho. Did he say Yeah, because was... he did a very natural thing of saying, Chris Jericho, how can I help you? It's like... I don't answer the phone like that. Maybe I should just... Yeah, I say a full name. Yeah. All right, so... Uh, I think Lana and Russo were backstage. They were talking about Lana's movie coming out. Yeah. She holds up the damn DVD cover for the camera. Her The interrogation. Yeah. And I think Russo was talking about uh, Reigns because he said... Oh, no, he was talking to Mick Foley. He said, you're just jealous because the Russo family... Uh, you're jealous of the Rusev family because you and your Holy Foley family are pathetic. And you... On the WWE. Yeah, right? you're pathetic and you hate each other. It's like the Holy Foley family. That's that's what they're called. Um, so, nice yeah. Plug. So our first match is uh, Rusev versus Seth Rollins. So I guess this is uh, Seth Rollins' baby face uh, fighting style, even though, like, We'll see it a little bit later, but in his like promos and stuff, he's still pretty much playing a heel. Uh, yeah, like who is the baby face? Who is the heel in this match? Who, who should I guess be? wrestling wise, <laughs> Seth was supposed to be uh, the baby face. Uh, they end up having a double count out, but uh, he, yeah, when in they uh, went up the yeah, ramp, they fight it out to the ramp stuff. to the new announced position, so he jumps off the announce table onto Russo and they acted like he was jumping off like the hell in the cell or something like oh no don't do exactly. it exactly like that, oh it's all like, high. It look as high as you guys are saying but maybe it's just the camera angle um so that was it for that match uh backstage um Dana Brooke is showing Mick Foley that uh Sasha and Bailey actually had a double pinfall which you mentioned yeah I mentioned that it <laughs> like, didn't look like a clear win for um sasha but so i think people are talking about that online like me 
and mm -hmm. uh, I think keen observers. Yeah, so I don't think that was done on purpose. I think they're just trying to cover up for that. So it ends up being set as a triple threat match between Sasha and Bailey. This makes yeah, Dana kind of gave uh, Mick the idea. Yeah, so uh, Charlotte's pissed Charlotte off about pissed. that. <laughs> so she pushes uh, Dana to the ground. It's like she pushed her by her boob in that um was talking her giant <laughs> Yeah. So I was uh we were talking on Facebook, but I was saying because like we have these brand exclusive pay per views, the Smack SmackDown's first pay per view backlash it ended with nut shots at the end of the the final two go home shows. So I felt like you have like a boob punch at the end of every raw. This was like towards yeah. the beginning, but I feel like this might qualify. So, but then I mentioned that it should be like a, a you know, like a, a twad swat. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I think that's a little more extreme. I think you should save that. For like, gentle to no, but the, if you want equality, I guess. Like it has to be the same. I don't know if it hurts gentle as much. To gentle to I mean, <laughs> we have to have our, our, our female correspondent to, to love that heels. One bad yeah. guy. Yeah. Or bad yeah, so the, everybody's just going to be attacking this one person. Yeah. It seems a little off balance unless they call somebody else up. At the uh, WWE live event in Chicago, at, uh, at the Allstate Arena, yeah. Emma was the guest uh, referee. Oh, so she was injured. Um, so is she She's, ready? To she apparently um, was clear, has been cleared to fight like six weeks ago, but they haven't had her. They haven't had her back on the. You know, either the shows on SmackDown had, or She Raw, wasn't drafted, she... I don't think. Yeah, exactly. She wasn't drafted. So it's interesting because the, really the main reason Dana is with Charlotte is because Emma was in. The storyline, yeah. yeah, exactly. They had to drop yeah, it. Yeah, because like she was tagged with Emma. So I'm guessing, so maybe that's a way that Emma can break away and still have that heel angle is if she just yeah. goes with, uh, if Dana goes with Emma. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And hopefully she'll be on Raw and not on SmackDown. It would make more sense because it would be like seven, I think, what, seven women on Raw and seven women on, or six women on Raw and six women on SmackDown. Something like that. Um, Something like it was that. funny that, um, like, during this match when Charlotte was targeting Sasha's back, I just thought it was funny that Michael Cole was, like, uh, talking to Corey Graves and said, Corey, you've had many injuries in your career. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know there's a difference between being cleared and actually being ready to compete. And one of his like like his input on that, but I was like, that's kind of insensitive. Like he's he's really <laughs> you fragile, broken piece of yeah, shit. Yeah, like he's only doing commentary now because his career was ended <laughs> in NXT. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of a heavy handed way to throw that in there. Um But true. Yeah. So Charlotte ends up winning this match for her team. Uh next we go back to Seth uh, Rollins, he is in Stephanie McMahon's office, and I, like this is what I was talking about before. It's like he is still, he is still a heel, and he is uh, like a white yeah. heel at that. It's like how, like how are people supposed to know how to react to him in the ring if he's like, like playing these dual roles? I feel like they should just officially turn him already, but he. he still whining again he's saying why did you throw me away and uh, i just came here to ask why um and then he's saying stephanie one of these days you're gonna come crawling back to me um so mm. yeah so that was that segment next we have bo dallas in another jobber match uh another match where the fans were chanting let's go jobber <laughs> yeah, I really wish that would catch on. It's just like, okay, just have these guys beat him. Nobody cares about Bo Dallas. He comes no. out with a sign that says Bo, Bo Leave in Bo, but then he does a poem that says Only I can believe in Bo. So what's the point of the sign? Like we're not supposed to believe in you. The only you can do it, so you don't need the sign. Bo to hell. Bo. Yeah. Bo leave already. Alright, so I just thought this guy Gary Graham, he looked like a lion, like with his his <laughs> hair and beard and everything. Um, Bo wins quickly, obviously. Um, he came in like a lion, but went out like a kid. Exactly. Um, we see another preview of the cruiserweight division. 
Uh, they show highlights of TJ Perkins versus Grant. The yeah, Grand Metalik. Um, next we have Cesaro versus Sheamus, match six. Uh, next is guess what <laughs> happened? <laughs> yeah, Cesaro wins. Next we have uh, Jericho backstage with his list of Jericho. He's, this was the best yeah. thing of the night. Um, it's funny that he's he talked about. Um, Mick Foley using cheap baby face pop, pops as catchphrases, which is exactly what he does. Um, <laughs> so uh, he he brings he brings the list out to the crowd and starts listing off his grievances. And uh, he's the best with the mic. He's he's probably the best ad libber. Yeah, that's the thing with Jericho is that he like he always turns heel. But his heel like things that his gimmicks that he says like the light up jacket or the uh scarf. yeah the scarf or the stupid idiot and like all his different phrases always catch on and end up turning him by accident. <laughs> so he because he even has like subtle catchphrases that he does like when he's out in the ring he'll start to like quiet, quiet, quiet. everybody I say quiet. <laughs> It's kind of like Miz is when my hand goes up, your mouth goes shut. I just like those things to control the crowd because it like gets them even more fired up. So uh, Enzo and Cass come out and interrupt him. Uh, they talk about uh, what about them. They could use all that footage. Um, so that would be cool. I mean, I, the one that I feel like it would be worth it for is like Sting. There's like almost 10 years of Sting's career that they don't have access to. So that'd be cool if they did a, a DVD on him. But otherwise, I don't really see the point. If they could build it up, and this is always, this was the hope when they did it with WCW, but it's, it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. But if they just bought it and just kept it completely separate and did not, like, had a completely different creative team and different marketing and everything and made it into real competition for themselves that would be great but, but that name is already tainted and i don't see them wanting to invest that much time in uh, a gamble like that so i'll say if they do buy it they're probably just gonna liquidate basically and just yeah pretty like, much take absorb it and pieces of whatever they want organism yeah. mm. so we'll see uh, a former WWE writer claims that uh, Stephanie McMahon and Triple H are running both Raw and SmackDown. I mean, that's not uh, a surprise to me. No, since of uh, uh, Vince, uh, you know, he's recovering from his uh, quad tear while doing heavy squats and getting a surgery for that. Um, WWE former WWE writer, writer Kurt Bauer discussed on the MLW radio that uh, Triple H and uh, Steph have been in charge of everything and making the uh, final decisions on uh, what goes on the air since uh, Vince is uh, recovering uh, from uh, surgery. Yeah, uh, but I'm sure if uh, Vince uh, shoots them a call, much like Chris Jericho shot to Mick Foley on Raw, that they would just do whatever he said. So he's, he's like... He's still like reviewing like the the scripts and yeah. like overseeing things from his hospital bed. Yeah, he's and... just a phone call away, and he can mandate whatever he wants whenever he chooses to. So yeah, so we can uh, we can either credit or blame Triple H and Steph for what happened on SmackDown and yeah. Raw this past yeah, week. Yeah, absolutely. For better or for yeah. worse. <laughs> uh, going back to. Um, you remember uh, when uh, Chris Jericho and Brock Lesnar allegedly got into it backstage at SummerSlam when uh, Jericho thought that uh, Lesnar was, uh, you know, taking advantage of uh, Orton's uh, head, yeah. there, splitting it open. Well, uh, Jericho was on um, a, a podcast uh, recently, and the uh, he talked. He gave a little bit of his side of the whole incident, and he he didn't deny that he and Brock. Uh, had a little brouhaha, a little or uh, nose to nose, nose to yeah. nose, and nose to nose, blah blah mm-hmm. blah. And he uh, he talked about uh, you know how even though uh, you know Lesnar is like a you know, you know bigger guy, you know he was concerned about his friend Randy, and he uh, you know he uh, he he 
grew up on the tough streets of Winnipeg and, you know, his dad, uh, you know, being in the NHL and all, you know, he was going to, you know, stand up to him no matter how big, bigger he was. Yeah, he was going to pull his shirt over his head and give him some hockey punches. Except Brock was probably not wearing a shirt at that time. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, yeah, the, he, as what had already been reported, you know, he didn't know that uh, the whole thing was a work, and yeah, he was concerned there. But uh, he, he says that whatever, you know, whatever happened between them is uh, pretty much just up to him and Brock. All so. right. They should play that into a uh, storyline, and just like bring that on screen. Although they have very little time with Brock, and they might not want to. Waste him on Jericho, so exactly. Yeah, yeah. Bret Hart um, once again is criticizing uh, Seth Rollins. Yeah, he he really needs uh, to get off that kid's back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on, man. He's just he probably idolized him and stuff. And uh, I mean, he had already when when he said the stuff about um, when Bret said that stuff about Seth um, breaking John Cena's nose, you know, a while back. Yeah. He yeah said that already. You know, said that he was pretty. You know. It kind of hurt his feelings a little bit. Yeah, because his whole thing is that Brett is always saying that I've never injured anybody in the ring and I was always safe. Like, blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. yeah. I guess like um, he was at like some I think it was at some convention that somebody asked him about it and he talked about how you know Seth you know he keeps like injuring you know these these wrestlers and like you know he's using like the you know making mistakes in the ring that you know. Like if you do that, you're a lousy wrestler, and, and that, that 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 was pretty much the um, the money quote, I guess, mm-hmm. was him calling a Seth Rollins a, a lousy wrestler. So. so the move in question, in generally, is that turnbuckle power bomb, which I guess is at this point has injured Sting, uh, they say basically ending his career and injured. Oh, wrestling fans, don't you dare be sour. Clap for your world famous six time podcasters and feel the power. Welcome to the Frustrated Wrestling Fan. This is episode number seven. And uh, I'm amazed that I got through that intro because I feel like yeah. uh, <laughs> crap. So, shit. Yeah. One would say. Yeah. So, um, I'm probably going to be hacking up a lung, but. In the meantime, let's get into some news. So uh, you pulled up a couple stories, so uh, how about we get into some of them? Yeah, uh, I think the, the first story that uh, I want to talk about is the uh, Kurt Angle. All right. Uh, U.S. Olympian, WWE. Who wrestled with a broken um, freaking neck. Exactly, yeah. exactly. He was on the uh, Dan Levertard uh, show or podcast, and he you know, was talking about you know his his days in the WWE and, you know, various stories and whatnot. And he mentioned that at one point uh, when he was addicted to, um, when he had a drug addiction, that he, on top of all of the vitamin cream, vitamin shakes and supplements and whatnot, was taking 65 Vicodin Oh, that sounds totally day. healthy. Yeah. I mean, just the, the thought of that would make my heart literally just stop. Yeah. So, yeah. So, where is he now with his Vicodin intake? Is he down to 20? Yeah, a, re- a reasonable yeah. amount of 20. He's weaning himself off with. What is a reasonable amount of Vicodin? I would think that probably taking one would be kind of bad. Yeah, I feel like, like how do you even get on that schedule where it's like, is it 65? What doctor would even give you that much um, some guy I mean, on the I corner who calls himself just... a doctor but exactly, exactly. He, he operates out of his own trench coat yeah. but yeah so that's uh, yeah I knew he was bad and that's probably one of the reasons why they will never bring him back to the WWE no, because no. those demons keep following him and he may collapse and die in the world. yeah that doesn't look good especially when it happens uh, with multiple superstars not necessarily in the ring but you don't want to have a lot of drug related deaths associated with your company even though whenever he does inevitably uh murder his girlfriend and then overdose 
he's going to be associated with WWE. Like the headline on CNN will say, former WWE star Kurt Angle <laughs> murders his family. Even though... Not an Olympic gold medalist or whatever? Uh, well, that'll be like a, a subheading. Like former WWE wrestler and Olympic gold medalist. The IOC will make sure that's shoved way down there. All right, so next. So moving on. Would you be interested in uh, seeing Matt Hardy uh, with the WWE after his TN- TNA contract expires? I've been watching some of the stuff he's been doing like the br- with the broken Matt Hardy. I finally watched the final deletion, and that, that whole production was just like insane. It was like TNA just gave them all the Free yeah, all the budget they <laughs> required and just did this sprawling like mini series or whatever. <laughs> and it was it was just ridiculous. Like, okay, uh, they have ideas, but those ideas aren't necessarily good. So maybe if you bring <laughs> Matt Hardy back as talent and not creative, maybe we could see another decent run from him, but uh, yeah, they just yeah. want we just want you for your body, not your mind. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, I never thought of uh, when I think of Matt Hardy. I never thought like, oh, he's got a great mind for wrestling. I just thought he was yeah. the the guy standing on the apron while Jeff Hardy he did great stuff. He hasn't been in the ring, the WWE ring, at, at least in six years. I didn't know it was, it was that long. Yeah. So I guess we'll see what happens with that because I'm assuming they'll. They'll use a lot of that crazy Matt Hardy stuff, but I just don't know how it will fit. But I guess we'll see. Are you uh, surprised that uh, Vince McMahon and the WWE allegedly are talking about buying TNA? Yeah, that, I heard there were a couple of bids out for it because it sounded like Billy Corgan just recently bought it, or maybe he didn't complete the sale or something, but now they're already looking for other buyers. So it's <laughs> like. Uh, then, a lot of people are saying that TNA is not worth buying. I think they value themselves on, at forty what, million. What? In that, it's tits and yeah. ass. How could you not like? Yeah, it? but forty million dollars worth. I, the most that <laughs> I would say they would be worth buying for is the tape library because they have WWE has a lot of their stars now. So if they wanted to make like documentaries or DVDs, I'd fill us in on that. Yeah. So, uh, but I feel like that's something you say for like Hell in the Cell. But anyway, uh, uh, so that uh, the this, next okay, so this this whole like Hispanic Heritage Month thing that like, the WWE and like uh, what's it uh, NBC Universal. like the uh, Universal yeah. or Univision or whatever. I thought that was kind of random that they just had this sort of like salute to Cesar Chavez. Yeah, this is weird because I thought <laughs> like usually when they do this stuff, I mean, I guess for the Black History Month they do like sure, wrestlers sure. and um, like George historical Washington figures. Peanut butter. So <laughs> it, it was just weird that they start off with Cesar Chavez. Like they should probably start off with Eddie Guerrero, but they save that I guess because of the cruiserweight thing later. But we'll get to that. So. Um, there's, they were doing previews throughout the night, so they showed a uh, video package for Cedric Alexander and the Brian Kendrick. And they showed their uh, little logo, um, which it, I think it's a weird choice, but I guess they're bringing over the aesthetic from the Cruiserweight Classic. And now, like, the Cruiserweight section of Monday Night Raw is going to be purple-themed. So it's like they're making it, Prince. yeah. So they're making it like their their own brand, except for they're taking place on the show Monday Night Raw. A brand within a yeah, brand. Yeah, so it's like you could have just given them Fabric their G. own yeah. show. Like you could have just spun the cruiserweight classic out into just a cruiserweight only TV show. But this is what they're doing. Um, so then we see. Owens and Jericho backstage. It took, uh, Jericho's talking about his list of grievances, so we have our tease for that. Um, I'm I'm keeping a running tally of <laughs> this move, the wrecking ball drop kick, and I think this week I've actually have marked off three people that did it: two on Raw and one on SmackDown. And one of them 
happens in this next match. Um, Braun Strowman versus Sin Cara. Um, mm-hmm. So Sin Cara uses his quickness, um, but... It was like the second time that they... Yeah, this is the, fought, the rematch like... from the original. So it's uh, it's really nothing different. I don't have the result on here, but Braun Strowman wins, right? I don't... Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, in the middle of that match, Sin Cara hits a wrecking ball drop kick at one point where uh, the move is basically you grab the ropes and you jump and you kick them through the ropes like a drop kick, a front facing drop kick without leaving yeah, yeah. the ring. Sometimes they leave the ring, but I just find it funny that this move keeps showing up. I don't know if it's something like in my head that I'm just seeing it more, but it's definitely. <laughs> It's definitely being called more. Like they're trying to make yeah. it work, they're trying to make it fashionable. Yeah, because Morrow on SmackDown like calls it every time, like Whoa. wrecking ball dropkick. But yeah, okay. So uh, Sasha and It'll Bailey. Uh, yeah, so Sasha and Bailey backstage, and I just found it funny that Bailey kept saying sister. <laughs> like, come on, sister. <laughs> like, brother. This is weird. It's like. I guess she's got kind of that John Cena slash Hulk Hogan uh, aesthetic, like with the bright colors and stuff. So I guess she's trying to trademark that as her thing. Like, let me tell you something, sister. I'm gonna. <laughs> what you gonna do when Bailey Mania hugs you? <laughs> I could totally see them going in that direction, and if they do, I want credit. Um. Uh, so Sasha and Bailey versus Charlotte and Dana is next. So uh, they keep building the story of the Charlotte and Dana split. And it's like, I don't, it's like they keep teasing it, then backing up. But then she goes right yeah. back to Charlotte. It's like she slapped her. I feel like that should have been an irredeemable moment. But it's like, I guess they're just going to do this dance with it to make the fans mm-hmm. anticipate it more. I saw something online where, like, allegedly, allegedly, the. The, the WWE like they're they want to like they're, they're gonna eventually make Dana like a baby face and like the whole Sasha like Bailey thing is just sort of like it's it's being used to sort of like get that going at some point. I feel like I don't I feel know like how, how the Dana thing is. is the smallest issue of all of them. I feel like Dana should really kind of be pushed to the side for when they are done with this Sasha and Bailey thing, but. I guess we'll see. I guess they're building towards that. Yeah. But I don't really know if that will work. I feel like I don't mind them splitting, but I don't think Dana should necessarily be a babyface because it's like, don't the babyfaces outnumber the heels on Raw if that happens? Because it's like, <laughs> you want to have like a decent, stable 